Well, I was back in BC Supreme Court again to cover another COVID-19 restriction related case for you guys. And in today's report, you're going to get the scoop of what went down in court. Dre Humphrey here with Rebel News. And in recent weeks, I've covered five different COVID-19 related cases for you guys. The first four were all challenges specific to BC's discriminatory vaccine passports. The first of those challenges was brought forth by the Canadian Constitution Foundation. The second was brought forth by the Democracy Fund, thanks to generous donations from people like you at our special website at fightvaccinepassports.com. The third was brought forth by a Victoria, B.C. man who self-represented himself named Jeremy Maddock. And the fourth was brought forward by the Canadian Society for the Advancement of Science in Public Policy. Now you can find in-depth reports on all four of those cases after you're done watching this report by opening up the description box below and clicking on the link there for this report. I'll make sure to hyperlink those cases in the written article for this report. But this case is about the motion to strike from the defendants about the notice of civil claim that was filed back in August of 2021 by lawyer Rocco Galati on behalf of Action for Canada. So like I said, that was filed back in August and we haven't seen anything else in the court until this past Tuesday. And basically the defendants, there's quite a bit of them. I want to say there were seven lawyers for different bodies, whether that be for Dr. Teresa Tam or Premier John Horgan, I'm assuming Dr. Bonnie Henry. <laughs> um, there was Vancouver Island Health, BC Ferries, there was also uh, BC TransLink. And this notice of claim is 391 pages long and has close to 20 different plaintiffs all about a broad scope of things that took place COVID-19 related restriction wise prior to August of 2021. So not about the vaccine passports and certainly not specifically targeted. Now, perhaps the long length of the notice of civil claim had something to do with the morning starting off a bit rocky. Get that? Rocky, Rocco. <laughs> I'm just joking. It's typical in the morning that the defendants would give their submissions. So you get to hear more of what they say, of course. But because it was so long, uh, there was probably an opportunity for the lawyers to have more to say about why they thought this case was struck, starting with how long it was. One of them said it was hard to follow. It's hard to know what's material versus non-material. Um, others said that words like it's scandalous, it's vexatious, it's an abuse. I believe it was Premier John Horgan's lawyer, uh, Mark Witten, who basically started to say things that sort of indicated he was suggesting it was a money grab. He pointed out that it was filed eight months ago and says there's been no legal action since that date. But he pointed out how much promotion had gone into the case um, and says that you know, I, you, if you look at my live tweets, you might have more context to what I'm saying here, but basically he was getting at that. This is a money grab. He even pointed to Mr. Galati's Twitter follower followers as an example. So I'm going to pause right here and cut to part of my interview with Tanya Gaw from Action for Canada to get her sort of statement on why it did take so long to get to this point. Right, and I'm happy to be able to finally talk about this. There are certain things that I haven't been able to make public, but uh, once you file, a, uh, the plaintiffs file a, a statement of claim, it's up to the defendants to respond. And they drag their heels like crazy. And so by the time they finally responded, and, and finally with all the defendants accepting the statement of claim, it was January. And of course, Rocco had been in a coma for 10 days in December and his recovery has been excruciating and very lengthy and he could not travel. And so that's why he attended by camera today. Now, hopping back into what happened, I forgot to mention that Mr. Galati attended virtually and seven of the lawyers were present. Um, probably that could be due to health issues. I'm not sure. Um, also, Mark Witten, for example, he brought up that, you know, he believes there's conspiracy theories in the case. Um, he also bought 
up Action for Canada's Notice for Liabilities, uh, something that they call many Canadians to do, the nonprofit. For example, perhaps if you were let go without pay, they have a notice of liability that you send to your employer to kind of say, hey, these are laws and you shouldn't do this to me. Now, I will, of course, link Action for Canada's site and the 391 page um, claim in the written report as well below. Council Witten's purpose for pointing out these notice of liabilities appeared to be that he was saying them in addition to the case shows that there is some sort of um, call for intimidating medical professionals in the government, you know, the health officials, for example, and people. He says that a layman can understand that these notice of liabilities are not certainly not a form of legal action, but to intimidate instead. There is some debate about that. Um, I know my colleague Tamara Ugolini interviewed a freedom-minded paralegal who also says that those notice of liabilities are not a credible form of legal action. Perhaps they have value for public record, but I'm going to cut Right now, it seems like a good time to do so to cut to a portion of my interview with Tanya Gaw from Action for Canada to get what her official statement is on the purpose of notice of liabilities that Action for Canada suggests people hand out. So the notice of liability is basically bringing awareness to somebody that what they're doing is causing harm or illegal and then requesting that they cease and desist or liability, legal action may be coming. And what can you say to the length? I know I will report on what Galati had to say, but it is a lengthy uh, claim. So what's your thoughts on that? Well, again, you know, their strategy and everything, as Rocco said today, they're going to complain if the case is too short um, and then they're going to complain if it's too long. But we wanted it as a matter of record as uh, the details of this case. Rocco is more than happy to adjust the case 50 pages if they like, but it was a matter of record. As he said, this is not a matter, matter of a milk truck hitting a cyclist. This is a massive case that in, involves, uh, you know, a, a global government. Now, I'm going to, of course, get to Galati's submissions. That happened in the afternoon, but I'm just making sure I didn't miss any of the key things that were said in the morning from the defendants who wish to have this case struck. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is that the gallery was packed, I'm assuming mostly with Action for Canada supporters. There were some people who didn't get in that were waiting outside, maybe 20 to 30. And then there was maybe about 15 to 20 who were actually protesting outside. Um, so I guess that brings me to some of the points that uh, Mr. Galati said when replying to the defendant's lawyer's submissions, said that he couldn't think of a bigger public interest than COVID-19 restrictions. So the argument of, hey, this case is a matter of public interest was strong. He also um, took the time to address the claims of conspiracy theories made against him. He said things like, you know, just because someone says it's a conspiracy theory doesn't mean it is and that the council didn't give any proof to support why they are making those claims. He said that he linked, he did uh, links to cite everything that he said. Um, some of the conspiracy theory claims that were said or accusations of conspiracy theories surrounded claims uh, surrounding Bill Gates and Dr. Bonnie Henry and Dr. Teresa Tam. And so he talked about how Dr. Teresa Tam and public health officer Dr. Henry both, you know, have uh, work, worked with the World Health Organization. Um, again, this case is very broad. So, so a lot of different topics from all over are being said. And perhaps that's, again, why some of the other lawyers have things to say about why it would be struck. Um, Galati also talked a lot about case law. He went into case law, um, court decisions about COVID-19 restrictions from the U.S., from India, from Portugal, for example, in 2020, in the courts in Portugal, they ruled that the PCR test is unreliable when it comes to whether or not someone can be determined to be infected with COVID-19. That's something I've been reporting on since 2020, but you saw that 
nevertheless, PCR cases were used to excuse lockdowns and restrictions and all of those sort of things. He also, you know, reminded the courts of his wins when it comes to being a constitution lawyer. He also said he found it concerning that one of the lawyers sort of pointed out 10 of his previous cases that had been struck but failed to mention that that was 10 out of nearly 600. Now, Galati had a lot to say. You can catch the bulk of the back and forth, including quotes from the seven lawyers or uh, Galati or Justice Alan Ross, who ruled over the case. But I suppose my favorite thing Galati said was something along the lines of, you know, Canadians don't have to kneel and kiss the feet of public officials who happen to have a medical degree. Um, so again, I'll link some of those uh, quotes and things like that below in the article. But also at the end of the day, after both sides had given their submissions, Justice Alan Ross asked the seven defendants' lawyers how long they needed to be able to reply to Mr. Galati's submissions, and they said no time at all. They chose not to reply at all. Now, I saw this fact being celebrated online, but of course, the flip side, um, I guess their celebrations were things like, oh, they didn't reply, there was no rod bottle because they knew they couldn't go up against Galati. But on the flip side, um, it could suggests that these lawyers who were paid quite a bit to be there and knew they had a big job to do felt very confident in their arguments and that's why they chose not to reply so whether or not uh justice ross decides to um that this case should be struck uh, or that this case should proceed and of course if so rebel news will be reporting on it when it's heard or perhaps Justice Ross is going to find sort of a happy medium and say, you know what, I'll give you two weeks to amend what he feels are in fact errors in the case and fix it up and shape it up and then come back and then maybe it will be heard from that point on. Either way, we don't know the answer to that yet. The justice has reserved his judgment. So we are waiting for that as we are waiting for Justice Hinkson to give his ruling on the other four cases. So there was a lot to go down here. Best way is to read my live tweets, which are linked below to get more of what went down. Do you want to help fight for medical freedom in British Columbia and across Canada as a whole? Then consider heading to our special website, Fight Vaccine Passport, to donate to keep the many challenges we are taking on. There are vaccine-related challenges and more to help set a new precedent for medical freedom in Canada. Again, that is fightvaccinepassports.com.